Welcome to the Tadwig 2020 working sessions. Again, this is um, session ITG3, which is the collection descriptions task group meeting. Um, I'm Matt Woodburn and will be moderating this session along with my co-moderator, who is Deb Paul. Um, we're both also extremely grateful to Holly Little and Jocelyn Pender, who are providing uh, the um, Zoom admin tech support and backup for the session. So that everybody is clear, the session is going to be recorded for later viewing. So if you do speak, then you'll be on tape of posterity. So just be aware of that. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all very much for joining us. I um, want to say thank you in advance to all the speakers that are going to be speaking in this session. Um, we'll tell you um, a bit more about the agenda. Um, but uh, just before we do that, um, to say that the Zoom chat function has been made available um, for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Please do use this um, judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. And um, <clears throat> there should be hopefully a link to the code of conduct document uh, going into chat, which you can look at for more information if you like. Um, people do have the ability to mute and unmute themselves, but if you're not speaking, please make sure you keep your micro microphones muted. Um, also, um, bear with us for any technical difficulties that might crop up. Um, and finally for this, I'd like to say a really big thank you to all the volunteers and the organizers who are making this session and this week work, and uh, to all of you, I hope you enjoy this session. So a bit more about the session itself and how you can participate. So you can see the, um, uh, the agenda up there at the moment. Um, it's scheduled for an hour and a half. We'll see how that goes. Um, there, will be, there will be points in the agenda where we will pause to take questions and to have more discussion. Um, we won't go over an hour and a half. If there's not a huge amount of discussion, we may finish a bit earlier, but we'll just see how that flows. Um, okay, so yeah, so I mean, because there's going to be, we think probably quite a lot of newcomers here, because there's more access to um, this conference in Melbourne physically, which is great. So we'll be doing a bit of a, an introduction um, for newcomers to that, but then doing on a slightly deeper dive into some of the challenges we've got from the data model and how we're testing that and then a quick finish off with um, a use case example for the synthesis collections digitalization dashboard. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Deb. So the aims of the session are mainly to try and expand the awareness of what the task group is doing, um, uh, working on the collections, descriptions, data standard and data model, and to try and explain some of the concepts that are emerging from the work so far, so that's mainly around the modeling area today, and um, particularly to try and invite more expertise from the community and get some help with the bits that we're struggling with and to get some more resources and some more work going, some more opinions into this piece, because we're always welcome to help out. Um, for this session, um, for contributing to, this, to the session, um, as I said, you can unmute your microphone, um, but what we'd like you to do, if you want to ask a question out loud, then if you could use the Zoom raise hand function, then that means we can, um, they can uh, ask you to speak at the, the right points in the um, agenda. Um, can you also please try and remember if you do do that, it would be great if people remember to lower their hands again afterwards so that we know that you are asking another question rather than it's just up there for legacy reasons. Um, there is a link there to the uh, Google Doc that we're using for this session, which is um, where we'd like um, people to help us taking notes, any notes, insights, etc but also where we're trying to organize the questions. We think rather than everything going into the Zoom chat where they kind of disappear in conversation going up the, uh, going up the page there, if you look in that um, Google doc, there is um, a section for questions under each of the agenda points, which means we can help to try and uh, group those questions a bit more. And we'll have other people from the task group who are trying to answer questions um, while you're asking them while others are speaking as well. So try and take a collaborative approach to that. But please do use the Zoom chat to talk to one another about any of the topics being discussed at the same time as well. And I think that, unless I've forgotten anything, is pretty much it for the um, logistics. And I will now pass over to Deb, who's going to run through an introduction to the task group's work. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session, uh, introducing the Collection Descriptions Task Group and Data Standard. Thanks for the introduction, Matt. So why do we want to describe a collection? And we're talking museum collections here. So there are many, many reasons why we would want to do that and many 
different stakeholders interested in this information. So I'm sure many of you here uh, come from different areas uh, with regard to interest here. So whether you're a museum administrator, a researcher, a collection manager, someone who develops policy, um, whether you're curating collections, all of these things are, are of interest to you and would be of interest uh, to many others as well if we could bring all that information together globally. So who's currently doing this kind of work? Many of you here, I'm sure are familiar with a lot of the resources shown on the right. So there are collections registries such as Index Herbariorum, which gathers all the information we can uh, about herbaria around the planet. So it's taxonomically organized. There's a future effort by the Distributed System of Scientific, Scientific Collections, DISCO, uh, that is planning to build a resource to capture the metadata about what's in 122 different institutions across 21 different countries in Europe. Uh, GBIF is in, in busy building us a resource that would give us country pages uh, for every country to tell us what collections they have and what's in them. So there are these global efforts, but also taxonomic efforts, national efforts, regional efforts, and institutional efforts, such as the one at the Smithsonian and the one at the Field Museum. So when we try to build a resource like this and the data model and data standards to go underneath it, there are quite a few um, challenges. Uh, just a few listed here are each one of those instances we just talked about uh, uses a different data model, a different schema, uh, doesn't, does not collect the same exact information. There's a lot of duplication of effort when you try to say, well, I would like my information to be in index or variorum and in a national resource, for example. Uh, there's the time involved, the people that have a limited time to generate all of this data and they need to have a reason to do it. So that it's important that there's a use and value for them in generating the data that we all need. And of course, all this is wrapped up in making it sustainable and interoperability is key to sustainability and incentivization. So the ultimate aim to build this resource for us here is to build a common standard. So much like those of you who might be familiar with ABCD or Darwin Core, we need a data standard that would allow us to put our collections data into it so we can better understand what we have locally and globally together. That means our tools, our software, and the APIs between those computers that hold all the data need to be able to talk to each other. So we need a plan to do this. And one of the things we need to do is make sure we're meeting community needs. So it was very cool that Synthesis Plus, as part of the DISCO uh, prepare effort, put together a consultation to get input from the community, the worldwide community, on what they would need from such a resource. And we are in the business of trying to look through that and figure out if we are meeting the community's uh, recommendations based on uh, what we have so far in the data standard. So how do we meet? Uh, we meet locally together when we can, all in one place. Uh, that's currently very difficult, but we also meet online uh, and we are working on, again, a data model in addition to the data standard, and then working on examples of testing the model with real data to make sure that it will work. This is a quick uh, slide to show you some of the tools that we use in doing this work. And then a little bit deeper dive in GitHub, if you were to visit our repo, and perhaps somebody can put the link in the chat, that that way people can see the tickets for each individual property and the definition that might be there or might need writing, and you can see how you can help. We've gone uh, to, we've made efforts to lower the participation barrier where we can to make sure that everybody who wants to contribute to this can uh, regardless of their familiarity with tools like GitHub. 
And we've tried to uh, create some new tools also to help us understand our progress better. And thank you, Sarah at the NHM for building us this, uh, this Microsoft Power Business Intelligence window into how many tickets we have in progress. So once we have a data uh, standard, we have a lot, a lot of terms, and we'd like to go to a museum, uh, Mies Botanic Garden, the Natural History Museum in London, uh, the Field Museum in Chicago, and say, can you do this? Can you take your museum data and find all the terms you need to put the data into it and the relationships uh, to the data and see if it, uh, if it works for you? And more about that uh, in a little bit. In addition to uh, lowering the participation barrier, we've uh, implemented some models that help the community participate uh, on a regular basis. For example, in these barbecues where we set aside two hours of time where we could work on our own, but we're working on our own together, which is to say we're all in the same space and can talk to each other via something like Slack so that if I'm working on something or um, Kate is working on something or they, we can talk to each other. We know that we're in that Slack space if we have a question. And we've had uh, several of these barbecues. Where are we at so far? In addition to the, the in-person meetings, uh, we have monthly meetings as well. And we have some weekly slots where we show up if we can uh, and work. As far as progress, we have 25 classes and 136 properties identified. Uh, and of all of those, 58 are ready for your review, 59 are in progress, which is to say people are busy trying to develop definitions and examples for them, but 44 need you, the community. We need definitions and vocabularies. The standard testing that's going on, Matt and Martin and uh, Sharon Grant will talk a bit more about that. And the data models and workflows the documentation is being developed to help explain how the model works. And the reference implementation, I believe Matt will give, uh, that's another way to say building an example of the entire thing from data standard plus the data model in a working instance of a collection description dashboard showing all the collections across 122 museums. So at this point, I have to say, and we can't say it enough, Matt and I, a huge thank you to everybody who has contributed to the work so far in the past and up to date. Again, we are um, carving a new path and we are creating a robust data standard and it's not possible to do that without you and the reality checks that, that you provide uh, when you bring your expertise to the table. So coming up next, uh, making sure that we are meeting uh, the needs as requested by the community, that we are uh, getting ready to finish the first draft of the data standard of the properties, and then we'll have to work with the Tadwig Vocabularies Task Group and Specifications to make sure we uh, meet those requirements. And then we will, of course, continue to uh, engage you, the community, uh, with reviewing the, the data model and testing it. So where do we need help? Finishing off the definitions, uh, certainly we need help with the uh, control vocabularies that is uh, hopefully you will know of some that already exist that we can use. And of course, miracle solutions for data modeling always appreciated. <laughs> we also will be uh, working to make sure we align or reuse elements of other standards. For example, the ABCD standard, that's, um, important that we remember to always look to see if something in the community is already there that we can that we can use rather than recreating another term. And we do need input from the geosciences community and have reached out and expect to get input from the uh, earth sciences and paleobiology interest group, as well as uh, USGS and the Indiana Geological and Water Survey. So hopefully that has uh, brought you to the point where you have some questions or some insights for us. And Matt, it's uh, our turn to take a few minutes for questions, yes? Yes, so if anyone wants to raise their hand or comment, there's no questions in the Google Doc at the moment. And I don't think there's outstanding ones in the chat, but if anyone would like to ask anything out loud, 
And please go ahead. Yeah, I've got one. Can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Right. Yes. Great. Uh, is there a plan to integrate this into existing infrastructures, meaning that you know integrate this into sort of the, the IPT or any any of the existing repositories for um, adoption? Um, that is a very good question. The um, I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, they are beginning the conversations about that. Um, that actually links into the um, Biogates provider software and IPT um, sessions later on Thursday and Friday this week. Um, and one thing <laughs> I need to do between now and then is put together something, um, a, an idea of how will this collection of work, the collection description of work might fit into those infrastructures, um, how it might potentially replace or enhance the, um, the collections related metadata areas of those as they stand at the moment. So that is, um, those, those are some of the key tools for actually um, being able to use this. Um, and then there are various infrastructures, um, things like DISCO in, in, the, in the EU and um, sorry, related to maybe US collections list and various- Matt, your sound just went, but maybe <laughs> there's just a delay. Oh, sorry, can we you- We can see you, you're now? not frozen, but we can't hear you. You can't hear anything uh, Now we Now ah, we can again. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, just saying yes, and, and there are other infrastructures and um, data structures <clears throat> of for collections data and for specimen data that we'll need to think about how this can be rolled out and used within them as well. So the beginning of those thoughts, but there are a lot of conversations happening around it at the moment. Like the, the collection registries, I can't remember, GBIF just um, took one over, right? But all the little, hmm. where you just register your collection, you don't actually have any collection information there. It's just a sort of registration for exposure from there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So we're also talking to Jeebeth about it as well. Um, a lot of people are very aware of this, but we just we need to get into the specifics as we're getting a better idea of the data model and of the standard, how these can actually intersect and how we'll actually this will work for the needs of each of those infrastructures and those communities. Okay, do we have any other comments at this point? We've set aside about five minutes after each section, to, just so everyone knows, to, for, to allow for questions. So, um, uh, Elspeth has a, a comment. Yeah. Okay, so Elspeth says, uh, so one figure that will potentially come out of this is the size of collections globally. Does anyone have a figure at the moment for the estimated number of specimens held in natural history slash science collections globally at the moment? It'll be interesting to see if anyone volunteers on that. <laughs> I know there are various figures um, and you're around the place and I suspect that actually Elspeth is closer to that work than most. And Router says three billion, so we have an answer. <laughs> so that's a current estimate, I guess, based on um, uh, various previous initiatives and, and, and factors. Um, what we'd like to do is move towards something else in the future which is a bit more qualified and part of the uh, part of this work is to be able to build up those estimates and make them interoperable so we can tally those up and maybe have a uh, you know an increasingly numeric or quantitative basis behind those estimates but that's good to have a, a figure on that thanks Arthur. so i have a quick question for everybody for everyone that's here joining us today and i see we have some um 90 participants if you have participated in contributing to the uh, natural collections description, the NCDs uh, draft standard, if you've contributed to CD, the collection descriptions, if you've come to a barbecue, if you've come to a workshop, if you've uh, added your input to this, could you put an exclamation point in the chat like that? So we can see how many of you here are contributors to the work. Your turn. Ah, so lots of people um, here with us today that have made contributions. So thank you very, very much for that.
Okay, that is good to know. Hopefully we'll also have some of those that haven't yet if you had the opportunity or known about this. You might get some more bangs in the chat next time round as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, oh, marvelous. Okay, so I think it's time to go to the next section. And yeah. I will, I'll stop sharing. So, uh, yes, please. I'm going to be outstanding. And just find this up. Just give me one second. Okay. I think we got there. Can everyone see that okay? I can. Yeah. <clears throat> one is good enough. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so this is one thing I wanted to focus on for this, um, for this session. So some of the challenges that we're having in the data, in the data model is one thing we've taken on in the group is that um, the two outputs <clears throat> of the group as we're looking at them, we have the bag of terms, which is basically the defined classes and properties that make up the standard. Um, but we also want to undertake um, uh, some work on the data model to try and um, figure out how we can define the data models that will help um, the standard be applied in a real, um, a range of real world scenarios. Um, if you find this quite confusing, it might be my attempt to put it across, but also please be reassured that I find this quite confusing. And this is an attempt to try and peel away some of the layers of confusion and get to something that's workable. So this is basically an indication of that approach. So I'd like to kick off by taking a very simplified abstract model of um, um, a single specimen or collection object. Um, so just for comparison purposes really, but the object can be considered as a central core entity in this data model, which is then described by another of different term um, attributes. And in many cases, the specimen can only have one value for each attribute. So it might only have one taxon, it could only have originated from one geographic location or be of a single preparation type, et cetera, et cetera. Now I am aware that I'm blatantly glossing over things like multi-taxon preparations and many other complexities and edge cases of specimen data modeling um, that make that a gross oversimplification, but please bear with me because it's just to make a, um, a particular point. Um, now in the CD model, we effectively replace that single object entity in the middle with an entity that instead represents a group of these objects, what we imagine should be calling an object group. Um, this has many of the same attributes as a single specimen object, because obviously it's um, actually describing the same kind of things, but just in a group rather than a single one. However, the main difference is that our object group can contain things which have a range of different values for the attached attributes. So for one object group, the objects within it that it represents can be from all over the planet or from a number of different taxa or different periods in geological time. So the key difference is that for each of these attributes, there's now potentially a one-to-many relationship between the object group and any of its attributes. And then to this, we need to add metrics. So is there any numeric assessment of the objects within the object group, such as the number of objects or the number of taxa, the number of them digitized to specific levels and so on. And this is one of the core aims of the CD model and standard is to add that denominator of numbers for all specimens digitized or undigitized um, and be able to use that to qualify what we already know about the digitized portion of the collection. But most of the challenges I find in the CD data model relate to these two things, the potential one-to-many relationship between an object group and any attribute and the impact that, that has on metrics about what's in the object group. But the fact that an object group represents a number of objects and therefore can be subdivided into smaller groups gives us two options for handling those relationships within the CD model. We're currently calling those options either treating the attribute as an association or as a dimension, although the terms might be subject to change in the future. But the association approach on the left is actually having um, one-to-many relationships between the object group and the attribute. So that's more of a tagging type structure. 
The dimensional approach on the right is where you say there can only be one value for any for an, for an attribute for any one object group. And in this example, that essentially means that you need to break down the collection into two object groups, one for the mammals, one for the reptiles. The difference becomes a bit more obvious when we apply two different attributes. Um, so in this case, biological taxonomy, geographic origin. For the association approach on the left, that's pretty simple. We've just attached multiple values for the new attribute to the same single object group. And from that model, we can tell that we have objects from Ethiopia and from Tanzania, and that we have mammals and we have reptiles. What we can't be sure of is how those two attributes interact. For example, the mammals might be all Ethiopian or all Tanzanian, or they might be some of both. We don't actually know from that. In the dimensional example on the right, we know exactly what comes from where within the collections. So it's a more complex data structure, which infers more effort, but there's things we can tell from it that we can't get from the simpler model on the left. So that's a bit of extra um, useful information about the collection that gives us, but it's at the cost of some added complexity and effort. But where it really begins to matter, however, is when you bring the metrics into the mix. And as mentioned, they're attached to the object group. And so for the associations approach, we just get one figure. We know how many objects we have overall, but that's it. However, the dimensional approach means that we're effectively creating a grid of every combination of values across the two attributes with metrics for each combination. So we know from that how many European reptiles there are, how many Tanzanian mammals. We can also aggregate data from within the dimensions to say accurately how many total reptiles we have or how many total objects from Tanzania. And we can also tally everything up overall and that gives us a total for the whole collection. So that gives us a lot more granular um, data. But there is, and this is a very important part of it, there's an increasing cost to the dimensional approach. In the real world, obviously, there are many more than two attributes, and each of them will have many more than two potential values. So while the association approach scales very easily, we just keep attaching new attributes and new values to the same object group. For the dimensional approach, we have to keep slicing up the collection into more and more smaller and smaller object groups. And then we have to estimate metrics for each of those object groups, which really isn't easy when you're talking about undigitized collections. So in practical terms, it's unrealistic to attempt to scale to more than maybe two or three dimensions in that um, before things start to get quite unworkable. So having got to that point in the thinking, it became clear that we need to start trying out these model options with some test data. And for that, we were fortunate enough to have Martin Treckles from the Maze of Botanic Gardens um, who set up an implementation of Wikibase um, using the CD standard as a kind of sandbox for us to play with. And uh, to tell you a little bit more about that and give you a temporary break from model diagrams, I will hand over to Martin if you are ready to talk. Yes, I am. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> I will try sharing my screen. Okay, can you see that? Okay, so uh, this is a specific instance of a wiki base that we uh, deployed to be able to test the CD standard as it is at the moment. Basically, this is something uh, which is for the ones that are familiar to Wikidata. It's the same as editing in Wikidata, but now with only the collection description uh properties implemented and this is also completely separate from wikidata so this is our little playground where we can do whatever we want and so uh, everyone to to make this work should uh play around with it uh and don't be afraid to make mistakes this is intended to make mistakes and so uh, it's just to see how workable the standard is uh, to give a quick overview. So when you go to the web page and uh, it's uh, here on top, uh, you will, before you can edit, you will have to request an account and this request will end up with me. So the, there is some control over it uh, since I will be the one uh, allowing or not allowing you to edit this uh, wiki base. I will try, and this will needs to evolve in, in the future, but I will try to make the main page as self-explanatory as possible. 
So um, uh, let's just have a look, a quick look at a practical example to give you uh, a first impression. Let's take, for example, an, a record of our institute. How does it look like? You have uh, an item with a Q number here, which is the institute. And then on this item, there is a, a few statements made. Uh, there is a property and a value of this property. And then you see that these properties are the uh, CD properties that are currently uh, implemented. For example, the acronym, the name, and so on. So basically what, you want, what we want you to do is to enter your institute in here and start giving it properties. And this is fairly easy. We can add a statement uh, on this uh, specific re record. Uh, it has some search functionality. So if we start uh, uh, searching, it will give you some suggestions on what kind of properties you can use. Uh, I will put some kind of uh, dummy thing in here, uh, for example, one, we save it. I made a statement on my institute. This is kind of a, a stupid statement that is not true. So we can also uh, just remove any statement that we made and it will be gone. So this is the playground we have. And here you can try to model uh, your, this is a record for an institute, but if we go back to the main page, uh, we did, did, for example, for a specific object group in here. Uh, this is an example of how you can do it. It sometimes takes a little bit of time to load. For example, here uh, I split it up the number of objects and the number of digital uh, objects uh, that you can do using uh, this kind of structure. But anyone is free to use this wiki base and you use the standard as uh, they think. Uh, one useful uh, page you have is, for example, if you go to the special pages here, really at the bottom of the page, you have a, a list of properties. Uh, this is one that could be very useful for you because it gives you an overview on all the properties that are currently inside uh, this uh, wiki base. Maybe to uh, close this, uh, what do you need to do when you have a new institute or a new collection that you want to enter? You can uh, go to a new item. In here, here you, the, the basic feature of this wiki base is the queue number, but you can give it a label and you can enter a new institute if you like to and you just cre create and you end up with an empty page where you can start giving properties to it. Uh, basically, if there is a lot of interest for this, uh, I'm uh, willing to later on uh, this year to organize a ve very practical sessions. I did already a few and few of you already had this kind of practical sessions of one hour where we can learn how to use uh, this wiki base and to enter your data. But it's fairly simple and the graphical user interface is quite straightforward. And since you should not be afraid of making mistakes, I just advise you to request an account and start entering stuff. If you really do wrong stuff, I can always fix that uh, later on. So thank you for listening. That's great, thanks very much, Martin. Um, so maybe we, I don't think we've got specific questions on that, so it might be that we wait till the end of the section and oh, we can deal with we, questions. We do, we do have one. Yeah, oh, first do. from Steve. Uh, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so for the moment I don't imply any uh, data model. So uh, I didn't want to put that restriction uh, on the wiki base from start, uh, such that you uh, give uh, people the chance to model their data as they uh, see it. Uh, but in a later stage, we can uh, we can uh, put more restrictions on how you enter your data, and also uh, in, whenever the standard is in a more uh, advanced state, we could think of doing some mass import of uh, collection data. Are there any other questions? Or oh, here we go. Uh, David Shorthouse and Warren have questions. So David Shorthouse asks, uh, 
once we're happy with the playground, what about migrating all to Wikidata proper? As the first part of the question. This is not in the in the initial planning. This could be considered, but this is rather difficult because you need to map then all of the properties to a proper uh, Wikidata uh, property. But this is something we definitely could look into. Uh, but that's when we have enough data to, to, to check this. And for now, it's really just uh, a playground, really it's a sandbox where you can be this, let the small children in you uh, release it. Uh, and then uh, for uh, Lauren, is it okay for an institute to, to use this and add their own data? Yes, anyone can use it, uh, but, but be uh, very aware that this is just indeed something to try and not meant to be publishing anything. So it's just to try out the standards. Yeah, and with the understanding that the data may well be blown away at some point and possibly kind of new progressive models put into it. Yes, yeah, so I would add that there is a tag question on David's David's input. David Shorehouse said, I think we, we may not have time, but it would be a task to take on a quote, does the governance of approval for properties make it too challenging? So it might be interesting to know at some point, someone who knows much more about Wikidata than I do, for example, which will be most of you, um, is what does that actually look like? What's the scope of that governance of approval with regard to the this data standard we come up with? Well, I don't know if, uh, if David would like to wait and give us what he thinks about that. I mean, I've heard a thing or two about Wikidata governance, but I've not come up against it mm. um, myself. It's definitely very challenging because you will anyway clash with the Wikidata community in this. Uh, they have a pretty good view on like, how they want to do this. And so you, the discussions will be pretty tough, like David uh, is indicated. To so. I guess my, my question was, would it be worthwhile to actually investigate that at some point? Like once we have a standard to look at that and go, here's what it would take or what Wikidata would be happy with or not. We can definitely start a discussion. Mm. Thanks. Okay, so we'll uh, move on to the next bit, which is picking up uh, three where I left off. So that's getting back into the uh, data bullying story again. Um, and then having had a look at um, uh, Wikibase and played in it like children for a while. Um, we then got to feed back some of those experiences into the modeling process. Um, I think there are a number of pointers that came out of people playing with it and um, firstly it was quite obvious that without any data model restrictions taking it as a complete sandbox and people did use a number of different approaches for how they structured their collection descriptions within the standard. Um, I suspect some of these were um, ways that were mostly um, but the partly just intuitive when using a Wikibase interface and kind of RDF like data structure. But others, I think, probably reflected different use cases as well. Um, it did also become particularly clear, um, especially from some very useful feedback from the guys at the Field Museum, that we needed to work out how a model can effectively support both very simple, high level collection descriptions and more detailed and granular collection descriptions, and also the levels in between. Um, we need to work out how people can start off very simply and then increase the detail of their collection descriptions over time. And um, you'll hear a bit more about that from um, uh, Sharon and uh, Kate, I think, um, after this section. And then and finally, well, one thing that came from Wikibase is, and in particular Martin's approach that he intuitively took, took for adding collection descriptions for uh, Maze and Botanic Gardens, it demonstrated that there was another option that we needed to think about for how we apply metrics within the data model, which could bring some potential benefits as well. So I mentioned earlier um, that in the original model that the metrics are directly attached to object groups. However, it can also be possible to attach those metrics um, to the relationships between the object group and the attribute. 
So this provides a means to add some more quantitative data um, to the collection description without having to split it down and manage multiple object groups. So it offsets some of the issues on the dimensional model. However, there are limitations to this approach as well, but it felt like it was something that needed further consideration. So it's another option. So that's where we started with those insights to begin to think more about how we could look at these model variants and climb back into this into pain and confusion that is CD data modeling. Um, we've established that there are three areas where we can take different approaches for our collection description scheme. And the first is that we can aim to have um, just one object group um, or to split into a number of different ones. Um, the second is, is that the attributes can be used either as, as associations or tags um, or as dimensions. And the third now was that we can attach metrics either to the object groups or to the relationships um, between the object groups and attributes. Um, and in fact, in the last two areas, we could potentially opt to use both options in tandem. So we wanted to test out some combinations of these options to find out which of them were viable and which were best suited to what collection description scenarios and what limitations each of those had. And to do this, we tried out um, eight different variants of the model, um, which were worked up like the example that you can see here. Um, these all use the very simplified test case I described earlier, so just two attributes, biological taxonomy and geographic origin, and each of those with just two possible values. And then for each one, having modeled them up, modeled up an example, um, then did a set of logical test queries to try and work out what each variant did or didn't allow us to assert from the metrics um, within that variant, and also an idea of how complex those calculations were. So I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear I'm not going to take you through each of those eight models today. Um, they will be available um, shortly if you do want to look at them in a bit more detail. And it's still a work in progress. We have started to put together an assessment of all of those variants. And the aim from that is to try and summarize the pros and cons of each of them, including that indication of the level of effort that each of them suggested for data creation, for data management, um, which calculations were possible using those metrics and also the relative complexity of the calculations. It does thankfully appear that there are some of the variants that would have little benefit or are highly impractical, and so we can rule them out. But with the remaining options then, the next task is really to try and figure out which would be the most effective for the different CD use cases. We know from the use cases that we've collected earlier um, in the task group's activities um, that they can vary quite considerably. So some of them are quite simple and high level, others are more detailed and complex. And they also include practical concerns like having a lack of resource to generate um, and manage large amounts of data, particularly about the non-digitized versions of uh, portions of collections. And so those need to be quick and simple solutions. They also have those different balances of quantitative and qualitative components with of accurate, accurate um, collection demographics being more key in some instances, um, richer text narratives being more important in others. So we have a range of different focuses and they kind of sit along a gradient from simple low effort to quite complex and involving rather more effort. To try to support all of these, our next step is to find a variant of the data model that would work most practically for each of these use cases, delivering what they need um, but also making it as easy as possible to generate news and maintain the data. And it's important, I think, that we document those rules once we, um, once we define them, and the limitations of each of the approaches, both so that humans can understand them when they are figuring out how to model their collection descriptions, but also so that machines can understand them in order to query them and aggregate the data, understand what they can and can't do. And we need to make sure that there is still interoperability between any different variants of the model as well, and we don't make any of them completely incompatible with each other. So this led to a first attempt at suggesting um, how we could use some model variants for different levels of collection description. So for example, we could start off with a very simple use case, um, just showing the scope of the collection by identifying one object group, perhaps the whole um, uh, the whole collection of a single institution and then just attaching attributes there as associations. So giving an idea of what's in it. We could then um, progress from that to a level two um, where metrics are added to that object group. So you then get an indication of size of the collection as well as uh, just scope. Move that to level three um, and 
there in addition to the overall metrics on the object group we're adding those metrics to the relationships with the attributes as well so giving an idea of recording how much um, or we have of each type of thing but not across the different attributes and then finally you get the level four that adds the breakdown of collection groups using dimensions and so letting us work out what the numbers are for each combination of those two attributes and you can also look at this as a workflow over time so for example the approach of an institution um, might be to start simple and then describe its collection its collection in progressively more detail over the course of time as opportunity and resources permit and as data becomes available so this is kind of the emerging theoretical side of it within the group but the acid test is obviously to see how well this kind of approach might work using real collection scenarios and data and so that's where guys at the field museum um, as willing and much appreciated guinea pigs for a lot of the task group work have just started um, an attempt on that and i will uh, stop this now and hand over to Sharon who's going to talk a bit more about what uh, their experiences have been. Okay, just bear with me while I grab the screen. Um, this, this. Okay, so hopefully folks can see my screen. This is going to be a real whistle stop and I'm going to trade off between Kate Webank who will do some of the wiki based stuff. So Kate, Janine and I um, and I were the Field Museum guinea pigs for this and what you've got here is the stage one diagram. Um, obviously we had to dig into what we thought the Field Museum's collections look like. It was, a, it was a reasonable good example because we have everything from the geological sciences, the biological sciences and then into the cultural and um, archive side of things. So we tried to do a bit of everything. Um, and what you can see here is equivalent to um, that stage one and a little bit of stage two. Um, so we can describe the field museum as a whole entity, the types of objects that we have, and a rough estimate of the quantities um, of objects that we have. So the next slide that I have, excuse me, is <clears throat> the Sparkle query. Oh yeah, so stage two and three. So what I've broken out here is um, what our anthropology collections would look like. Because the idea is that whilst this is, we're focusing mostly on the natural history side, that it's a model, it's applicable to everything. So we've broken out in a bit more detail. We have the anthropology object group. Um, it's divided up geographically for us. And now we've started to put um, the dimensions, the actual quantities within each uh, geographic class. So then following on from that, this is what geology looks like. So it's a much more natural history focused collection. But again, we've broken down geology. We've said we have fossils and specimens. And then I've taken the fossil example and broken that out and as you can see you can get much more um, granular in terms of the, the counts that you have there. So I'll hand over to Kate and let her talk about the wiki based side of things Kate, if you're around. Yep uh, do you want me to talk over your slides that works for yeah, me? Yeah sure. If it, cool um, so uh, we try I guess do you want to pop up to the stage one uh, wiki See, let's go back. Back, there you back go. right there. Cool. Um, so, sort of trying to parallel the stages um, as Matt and Sharon just showed. Um, I am very rough with uh, Sparkle queries, the language that can be used um, to search on Wikibase. And Martin gave us a really nice um, couple of examples actually on the front page from the, if you go to that Tadwig. Uh, Wikibase link, which I can re-add in the chat or if someone's up for that. Um, basically at the bottom of that front page, Martin set up a few example queries. And so I tried Frankensteining our own uh, data into a few of those just to see if we could search for, in this case, um, our example Field Museum of Natural History Wikibase record and each of its um, 
component so far component collections that have been set up in Wikibase with uh, Field Museum of Natural History as their institution. Um, from inside the Field Museum, uh, we would we would know that actually a few of the things that are directly linked here are actually uh, ch grandchildren, for instance, the botany collection and the bryophyte collection um, have not quite this relationship. So that's where we're trying to work out a few of those um, things and maybe the data structure, but just to start out at that stage one of showing the, um, I guess the, this obviously doesn't show the geographic and um, count pieces yet, um, but this is our first first try at that. If you follow that tiny URL, um, URL, you can sort of run this for yourself and edit some of the, uh, the query or display. Um, I think I'll go ahead and talk through the second piece. And from there, if, if we're feeling brave enough to also try a live demo, I'm happy to press some buttons. Um, so this then subsequently is the stage two with a few more of the uh, properties broken out um, regarding count. It's a little hard by my limited grasp of Sparkle, it's a little hard to show um, some of those more detailed pieces of the properties. Um, but in, in Wikibase's Sparkle setup, you can hover over each of the nodes to get a little more information. Or if you click and hold on some of them, it sort of like weird things spring out of a node and you can get a little more detail. Um, so again, this is just one way to kind of lay out and visualize that data, um, which if we get a better grasp on it, or if someone in the community already has a better grasp, um, this might be a nice quick way to get an overview of what you have set up and how um, would folks like a short, short demo of, of things. Oh, bra oh brave Kate. Mm -hmm. It was yes, nice please. knowing you all. <laughs> Can we go drive <laughs> over this cliff now? I'll stop sharing and give you the screen. Okay. And Martin did such a good job. I feel like I'm just gonna, uh, um, all right, sharing. So I'm gonna actually go over. Can folks see this okay so far? Okay. So I'm gonna open up this second query um, and clicking that link, it runs the query and just shows us the graph at first. Um, if I hover over the circular nodes, if they stop swimming, um, this one actually pulls in a little bit from the NASA um, Institute as well. So I hovered and I clicked, there's a little delay, but this pops out a little more information as well um, from BR2 within the NASA uh, record. Uh, if I hover again, it shows us that there's a count of, I think, 3,073,000. Um, in this case, I believe these are curatorial objects. Um, and the size of the node reflects that as well. Um, so over here, two, 2 million some odd pieces in the Field Museum Zoology collection. And if I subsequently wanted to sort of edit the query, um, if you hover towards the right side of your screen when you're looking at one of these pieces, uh, you can edit the Sparkle queries, um, which look basically like this up on the top of the screen. Um, I'm making a little bit of a mess here by asking it to show us as many sort of pieces as we can. Um, but from here on down, I sort of took one of Martin's examples, which I think was looking for a count of items in a record. Um, and tried to get it to show show that down here on the uh, uh, on the graph that I cannot find it anymore. So I'm failing at my live demo. Um, if I can get nope, or actually, sorry, if we run this again by pressing the blue arrow, um, that will then pop up the graph again. And from here, just to show you how how do we enter these um, counts on some of the records? Um, if you double click a node, it should take you to the page. Um, for that item. So in this case, for the bryophyte collection, uh, we set it up with the institution field museum. Um, if we wanted to maybe have more of that hierarchy, we could flesh out this record a bit more. Um, but down at the end, I followed um, some examples that Matt and Martin um, set up by adding in the object type as organism, um, Janine and Sharon might 
we might have some tweaking on this to do, but using the quantity and quantity method, um, we're able to enter at least static snapshots for now of how many things might be inside of uh, this record. So um, I'll kind of, that's about as far as I can go on this piece. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, if, I don't know if Sharon did any next pieces. Nope. Any questions? Yeah, it wasn't the uh, simplest to begin with, but once you get a hang of it, um, the, the key really is to map out your, your data first before you try and put it into Wikibase. Going in and just dumping it all in one go was, was problematic, but once you've mapped it out conceptually, then moving it across was less scary. Yeah, and we did have, it's interesting already to see a few of the differences between how we're structuring the field museum data versus MESA and NHM, each has maybe a slightly different um, approach, maybe uh, within, I don't know if Matt, some of the models, we might mostly be following a similar model, but. Yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a particularly interesting point. And the NHM stuff that I put in was very much trying to do the dimensional approach. Whereas I think yours and Martin's are, more similar to taking the more kind of graphy associations approach. So what would be, did, did you try doing queries across all three of the institutions? And did they seem to be, did that seem to work at all? Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try and hunt one of those down and put a link in the chat. If uh, there are some, it makes it difficult to sort of show the same apples to apples kind of properties um, as it is currently. Um, but I don't know if that's my limited grasp of Sparkle at the same time. Uh, one, one thing to notice, of course, is that it becomes easier if everyone is following the same model because then you can do real uh, aggregation of data. But in this first stage, that's really not yet the fully, fully the goal, but you can at least try for similar records to get the numbers out. Okay, well, that's, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sharon and Kate. Um, I certainly found the, the Wikibase experience, and uh, again, thanks to Martin for getting all that set up. It was um, it's very much an eye opener. Um, also, from my side, trying to build data into there, taking the very structured dimensional, using each class within the model approach. It is. Um, it takes quite a while to build up your, the first set of collection descriptions because you have to, I think it's like building most databases, you're, you need to create all of your lookup tables and your control vocabularies and then have to set up the institutions and the organizational structure and then start putting collections data onto it. So there did seem to be a bit of a, an overhead in that approach, but then things started speeding up as you could then had the, uh, you had the other data metadata there to start attaching the collections data to, and it got a, a rather quicker at that point. Um, Steve has his hand up. Do you like to ask a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So um, I, I'm very interested in seeing how you're making this work. The one thing about having this operating in like the Wikibase instance is it's kind of like you're, to make it work the way you're demonstrating this, you have to almost commit to like a linked data approach. Um, is that something <laughs> that the group is committing to? Um, it, I think so, so, so some of the variants are basically a linked data approach. If you're putting those, um, uh, those metrics on, on the attributes, then that pretty much is. You, you can build that into a relational database, but you will have a plethora of uh, link tables, so it doesn't really fit very nicely with that. But um, I think that the, the aim is that some, some of the use cases will fit a linked data approach better. And it seems like some of the other use cases, the more structured dimensional quantitative ones where, um, that's more of a relation, relational structure. So I think there are going to be, there's going to be difficulties which, with, with whichever kind of databasing or paradigm you're, you're going with. 
I'm not quite sure how that's going to work across the various platforms. We're going to have to find ways to do it where it's got reasonably um, for as many of them as possible. Um, and very interested in any viewpoints that people have on, you know, wh whether any of these modeling approaches are not going to be feasible because they would be tying us down to a very particular or a very niche way of actually implementing them in the real world. Well, Matt, do you see David's questions? Uh, Martin, etc. Everybody, take a chance, take us time to read those. Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah. So David had asked, um, "Will you be able to, or are you able to model the provenance of collections, such as when they are split and scattered across many institutions and then possibly reamalgamated?" And use cases given mentions of uh, collections in older literature, would you be able to answer where that collection resides today, assuming you have the data to track provenance? So that is something that we have talked about. Um, that's something that um, particularly um, came again from the, uh, the Field Museum. Um, that was quite a core part of their, I guess, main use case was being able to track how collections, sub uh, divisions of collections, change over time, including things like, I think it's accessions and um, uh, yeah, some other elements. We haven't really got onto the best way to do it. We, we, I think the closest we'd got to, or I'd got to, was thinking that um, provontology was probably the best place to start with on how we could do that. But because we've got some f fundamentals to work out at the moment, it's kind of, it seems to be a bit further down the line of priorities that we need to get the standard um, definitions and some of the more data model fundamentals sorted first, but that is something that we, will, we definitely want to move on to. Yeah, David, that was that was a big part of our use case, like Matt said, because, um, I mean, we're not the oldest museum on the world, but we certainly have a long and weird history of splitting and lumping and in order to get that, that documented correctly, we we put a big old block in there as a placeholder to, to make sure that there's at least a hook for it. Is it also, I mean, it's sometime we have discussed the fact that one of the things we ask for in the model is that the collection description itself or the object is going to get an identifier. And so I think parallel or tangential to what you just asked is what if you have the HMS Challenger collection and it lives all over the place? it's distributed. So how, how, how would people describe what they have from the HMS Challenger and provide that in such a way that all the collection descriptions from institutions that hold some of that could find each other. And so then you essentially would recreate the HMS Challenger expedition. That's that parallel, David, to sort of what you were asking? Uh, that's a yes. <laughs> um, and I, I would just very briefly throw on top of that, that when we do get into that, that kind of uh, that modeling, there is an additional challenge of being able to model the provenance of it's the physical collections and how those change and the digital representation of those collections and how those change because so most people want to combine two collection descriptions um, conceptually, because they've say, reorganized their kind of museum's hierarchy and collections hierarchy. So they say, I want to treat these as the same thing. Nothing has changed in the physical collections, but you still have a you know, two digital objects that need to become one digital object and you need to know the provenance behind that as well. So and that also gets thrown into the mix. I found that almost impossible to do. I've, I've had that exact problem in both, both ends of it. And I ended up just stopping one of them and just splitting it and going back just because it's it's it gets too cumbersome you know yeah some of it is also tied to the platform because it's it's a question of who has the master record of the, the whole thing if we all have bits of the split thing um which kind of points me down to tim and the ipt and gbif and gr cycle and things like that but that's why it kind of paused a little because we knew we were getting into a platform issue as opposed to a data standard issue which is can we make sure we have the fields for it and then we can work on the implementation of it as a kind of second phase. Would you guys include versioning just as a default? I mean, it, it, 
that covers, I mean, we have a new curator of homology, for example, and I know he wants to rewrite the collection description right from the old one, but it'd be nice to keep the old ones like version one and then he has version two and write him down, things like that. I'm sure that happens quite a bit. The new curator is uh, ambitious and wants to rewrite and change things, right? You know, it's just natural, right? But it'd be nice to keep the old one too. Yeah, once, once the platform gets lined out, we're gonna have to have some kind of versioning. I don't know if that's something we can put in the standard. We should put a pin in that. I think that sounds like something worth investigating, right, Matt? Yeah, so these are um, things we're definitely filing under future problems. There's a quick, quick perspective on that too, just to again, tie these pieces together. And some of you already know this, but for the benefit of those who haven't heard it before, so certainly when we started this research, just in brief, we went and looked for other groups that have tried to do something very similar. So if you think of museum or like as analogous to a library, so think of library special collections. And there are books in the world that have been divided up into parts and Japan has five pages of that book. And Germany has 12 pages of that book and America has two pages of that book, whatever. And so there's been the, how do you bring those back together so that the user in the digital world can access that book as a whole but yet nobody wants to give up their two pages or five pages or 12 to all one institution. And so you have to figure out, and the short version around what I'm trying to say is two things. Um, there you go. Yeah, you can't solve social problems with code. So yeah, you have to find other ways around how you are going to help these things find each other. But you also have the issue that the special collections, people tried to do this back in 2000, what we're trying to do now. Um, and they basically found it to be too hard and gave up. Uh, and so I think we've already gotten further than they did, but it is definitely challenging once it gets uh, sort of beyond the top level and all those different multiple dimensions that Matt was mentioning, it definitely gets complicated. Yeah, so we need to focus on some, some simple simplish approaches and quick wins let's <laughs> actually prove some parts of it and then be able to build on that i think i'm uh, just thinking if anyone else has got any hands up or are there any other questions relating to that i think there's a there's a thread with carlos <clears throat> that might be worth picking up So it might take a little bit to pause it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're reading, Carlos. Yeah. <laughs> and feel free to speak. Yes, uh, so the, the long one, you can leave it for, for later discussion. But basically, I am I'm managing a scratch pass, scratch pass based uh, database, Myriatrix. So I was basically aggregating content in the scope of the uh, International Society of Myriapodology. So that will be all Myriapoda and all Onychophora of the world. And they are in the taxonomic backbone. So I already have the species. But uh, there is a wonderful paper uh, co-authored by Petra Sirwell at the Field Museum. And she made this survey um, of the milliped collections of the world. So that is basically a good use case of which kind of high level collection information data we want to have for a taxonomic group. So I wanted to capture that information into um, collection content type, a new content type for, for Scratchpad's uh, platform. So I am very interested in later linking with, with people working on the collection uh, standard development and see if I can reuse your, your fields. And then maybe if we find that, that some fields need to be added for information that is already captured. And I want to, to maintain this, um, this data set or expand it because it's usable for other Myriapod groups and only go for. So that's basically it. It's an expression of interest more than a question. And the, the, the publication at the end has a formulary with the fields and the information that was requested. So we basically have the, the primary fields, so to say, for, for developing this content type. That's it. Thanks, Carlos. And that's, that's very interesting. And actually, um, 
can I work in the same team as the Scratchpad developers? And it never occurred to me that this is something which um, might be interested in kind of bringing into that platform as well. So actually having that raised is extremely useful. Um, of course, I know there's a lot of conversation going on around um, scratch pads and uh, you know the biodiversity VRE environment in general. And so there may be collection descriptions um, in some form is something that needs to get put on their agenda and see whether there's a place for that um, for it in that conversation as well. So yeah, that's another interesting one. Okay, um, does anyone else have any other comments on this point? I mean, we still have a bit of time. I have got a um, two minute um, talk about the uh, synthesis collection digitalization dashboard to do. So there's still plenty of time for conversation here. We can always kind of resume after that if no one's got anything right now. I'll take that as a no and charge on. Okay. Um, yeah, so this um, very quickly is just something that um, I wanted to highlight as a related initiative to um, the Tadwig CD work and it's basically an early example of CD adoption. So the Synthesis Plus Collections Digitization Dashboard, CDD, um, basically it's a dynamic prototype dashboard, yeah, kind of emphasis on the prototype at the moment, which is showing collections breakdowns and demographics um, and including kind of measures of digitization progress and it's across multiple institutions um, uh, within the uh, EU. Um, the initial design work was carried out under a project called iStig, which was effectively the design study for DISCO, the Distributed System of Scientific Collections, which is um, the infrastructure um, which is being built in um, in Europe for time together, um, or providing kind of infrastructure services for um, uh, natural history collections in Europe. Um, and the dashboard was based on use cases developed for DISCO around collection subscription discovery and um, progressing collections digitization. So the prototype was recently developed as part of the Synthesis Plus project, which is another DISCO project, and that was in a work package under the leadership of CTAF. And it includes collections data sourced from six European Synthesis Plus partner institutions, and we're hoping to add another three over the next uh, um, week or so. And I think why I wanted to raise it as being of interest is that it's quite a good test case for CDs. So it's got a, a data structure that's heavily based on the CD data standard and the model concepts, or at least the standard and the concepts as they existed about three or four months ago when we first started doing it. So it's quite an early stage. But it is a very um, clear example of using that dimensional approach um, because it's a very quantitative scheme because it's meant to be delivering dynamic um, measurable dashboard data and visualizations. And the process of putting it together really made clear those limitations that I talked about for the dimensions and scaling up in the dimensional approach. So it had it has four different hierarchical dimensions, um, but combining all four of those dimensions within the same data set would have just been unfeasible for data collection. We would have been going to each <coughs> institution and asking for tens of thousands of data points about their undigitized collections. And you can imagine what the uh, curatorial response to that kind of uh, request would be. Um, so we had to get a bit creative um, with that in using um, multiple collection description schemes, which is something within the, um, the uh, uh, CD data standard model as well to be able to um, separate out these multiple parallel breakdowns of these collections but still be able to join them up in the dashboard. So it, it, it kind of it was a real world test of some of the theory on it. Um, so basically it's just I just wanted to highlight it because it's, it's useful from the CD perspective and it demonstrates an example of a CD data model and showing how um, no, for a particular use case, you only need a certain number of the um, classes within there, actually quite a small subset of what the overall 25 class 100 odd um, property scheme is. Um, it gave a good opening introduction to um, how we might put together um, forms 
and interfaces for um, these quantitative schemes by effectively templating that in Google Sheets. And then we also have the dashboard itself um, in Power BI, for which the link is on here, and it's also um, within the Google Doc. Um, and there's just an invitation for anybody that wants to go in and have a look and be able to play around. It just um, demonstrates to a degree what you can do with a dimensional um, approach to CD um, data. Um, also, the schema and the data will, in the not too distant future, be published openly in the Disco GitHub. Uh, so that'll be available for people to download and have a look at and play around with as well. So, yes, anyone that wants to have a look <laughs> or any questions on that, I urge them to try it out. Um, it will be useful when we have some less dimensional, less quantitative schemes like the ones that are going in Wikibase to be able to put these two, I think, side by side and, and see how they might be able to link up. Um, Matt, could you put the link again? I was too fast for me. I'm not sure about other people, but it was rebrand.ly forward slash what? Uh, let me just stick that in the chat. I almost got it, but not quite. There we go. Thanks. So I think you guys will see, um, hopefully you have some questions or some insights for us as we wrap this up soon, um, that we've gone from sort of the historical, why are we trying to do this? Where did it come from? Um, and what we've been doing to get there, and then giving you some ideas of people putting it to the test uh, to see if it, if it can work. And as we begin to um, come to version one and then look for where we're going to need to revise it. So hopefully that link to the, that Matt just shared also gives you a, another example. Okay, so yes, I mean, any comments on any of the stuff from the session? I think there's something left over. Quick question about the the, the synthesis dashboard. Does, are there any interoperable hangups using uh, the Microsoft Business um, Tools BI, where you have to use Microsoft tools and sort of utilize it, or does it is it interoperable? Um, so the I mean the the, the data is in the MySQL database. Um, so it's just the visualization which is happening through the, uh, the Power BI. So you don't have to even use a Microsoft SQL Server. You can use a MySQL database to power this. Use MySQL database. To pull oh, it. Yeah, I mean, for, okay. um, you can pull in from a lot of different data sources from, a, from Power BI, yeah. okay. including APIs and um, uh, yeah, JSON, etc. Sounds good. Microsoft has gotten flexible. Over it has. <laughs> it's just good. gone a little bit less, less yeah. possessive over the years. And we will also be putting the um, uh, Power BI file, which effectively contains a dashboard, into the um, into the repo as well. Um, which you you don't need a license to download the desktop version and to open it up and create visualizations. You only need um, any license to be able to push it to the cloud and share with other people. So as for kind of a sandbox, and it should be available as a pack for people to have a play and see what they think. Okay, so um, yeah, does anybody have any more comments at all? Anything that they might want to raise? We have a max of 10 minutes remaining. Any questions about next steps? Quentin. <laughs> I just wonder when you're going to be finished, when are we going to have our first prototype? It's a very good prototype <laughs> draft. <laughs> I mean, it has to be acknowledged that we were aiming for the first draft of the standard to be ready um, round about now-ish. We are somewhat behind on that. Um, I think that's for a, a few reasons, um, people's time, but also I guess we're, we are splitting our efforts between the standard definitions and development and the data modeling um, definitions. So it would be interesting if people have opinions on whether we should in a sense, kind of 
park the data modeling side for a bit and just go full bore and trying to get the definitions out or whether pushing out a set of the definitions without having guidance and data models um, and reference examples for people telling, helping people to use it, whether that would be a dangerous move and that um, you know, it would be tricky for people to adopt it and then try and um, uh, adopt the data models later on. So I'll be interested in any opinions on that because we, we could focus very much on the definitions and accelerate that part of it. I mean, do you have an opinion on that, Quentin? <laughs> I do. I was kind of just being silent so other people could have an opinion. But um, I, I see parallels with Darwin Core, which is largely just a list of definitions. Um, and that's enough work in itself, uh, just maintaining those definitions and uh, preparing all of that. Um, I also think if, once you start preparing that, uh, if there is a real conflict, you'll it'll soon become obvious as you try and write it down. <laughs> and that sometimes uh, writing things down for publication crystallizes um, some of the issues and uh, that will bring it forward. You see, I'm pushing you a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you, Quentin. I think, I mean, we yeah, actually, we had to do the this round of cross-referencing the actual data with the potential models to, to iron out some of the bigger, um, what shall I say, issues around using the darn thing. Um, so, because, you know, we don't want to end up with a standard that, looks great on paper and nobody can actually use because you know we've tried well the world tried that before and it, you know this is where we are now but I, I do agree that we could probably focus on getting the terms knocked out now unless and then putting those fleshed out terms out for for review um, we kind of have to trust our instincts a little bit now and just give it a shot right that's really useful feedback. I think so. I would, um, yeah, I, I think I would, I would back that view also by because um, I think from all the modeling work and all the variance work recently, I would say that throughout that process, nothing has really substantially changed the actual classes and properties themselves. We're still working with pretty much the same list, and I haven't really seen the impact on that. So that does give me a bit more confidence that uh, the model is not going to affect that hugely. So yeah, I suggest it's time to refocus back on that for the time being and get that first version out. Um, I mean, Deb, <laughs> do you have any uh, kind of comments on that as a kind of a co-convener? Well, yes. So one, uh, anybody here who's not currently a member or contributing that would like to that saw a place where they might. Uh, review the current definitions that we've done, help us fill out the ones we don't have, um, help us discover controlled vocabularies for some of those terms that might already exist, um, help us with the geosciences bit if you have that expertise or you know someone in the community who does. And by that I'll briefly describe it and other people chime in. Uh, briefly I would say we are trying to use existing terms uh, for expressing time, for geologic time, but we'd like to have that encompass the broader scope of the sort of zooarchaeological time concept of 1500 BC or 2000 years ago, right? Uh, compared with saying it was in the Devonian period or in a particular stratigraphic layer, chronostratigraphy. Anyway, so we'd like to keep that um, so that we don't have to create a bunch of new terms but traditionally those two time spans haven't really been lumped together. So making sure we come up with controlled vocabularies for those things so that people can fill them out and understand what to put in each box, we definitely need input. And anybody who thinks I, they need to clarify that, please jump in, in case I said it oddly. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And uh, 
anyone that wants to put their hand up to help with that. Um, and I think also people that are very familiar with ABCD, with Darwin Core, with other standards that, uh, that we do need to make sure that we're not reinventing or reinventing parts of, um, uh, particularly for the review stage. Um, I think, and I think that will be an important part of the the first review stage is for people to look at our terms and say, actually, there is an existing one here that you've missed. We can use that one. Um, that would be very, very useful resource and uh, advice to have as well. There's a comment in there from Steve um, and one from Patricia. Hmm. Ah, yes. Um, so the comment from Steve, did you, did you want to speak that one? Well, I just, I am sort of lurking in a number mm -hmm. of different groups and this question of how we model anything that's not flat comes up in every single group. And it seems to, I mean, uh, it seems obvious to me that a linked data approach would probably work across all of the different standards, but I've also seen a reluctance within the Tadweed community to make any kind of commitment to linked data. So if not linked data, then what is the approach? And the, the TAG is supposedly the group within Tadwig that coordinates interoperability among all the standards. And rather than having every standard go off in their own direction on this, it seems like there needs to be some Tadwig wide um, uh, looking at uh, at uh, suitable approaches. And it seems like the TAG is the group that should do that. Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> TAG is Technical <clears throat> Architecture Group. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we need to find someone to take that forward to the TAG. <laughs> yeah. So is that the question y'all, some of you have heard me ask before when I start asking about who are the people in the community who understand what the possible models are and the, impl and the implications for using them when they get um, complex or when they're hierarchical versus dimensional and who, who are those people? Where do we find them? So if you know of people, we definitely need their insights. <laughs> Thanks, David. Yes. Under very large rocks. Yes. Oh my goodness. You need is people with big levers and then mm. <coughs> we'll get under those rocks. Uh, so thank you very much to everybody here, uh, everyone who's contributed, everyone who has been a part of these efforts and for coming today to, uh, to learn, to add your insights, to find out what this is all about. And we would, we would love to um, add your expertise and your insights to our work. Uh, and with that, we have like less than one minute left. Um, you know where to find us on GitHub, I assume. You can find us at tadwig.org at the GitHub site. And what I'd like to do is get people, if you, if you want to turn your cameras on, I thought I'd take a couple screenshots so we can all say we were here um, if you want to. So, all right. And I think we have to take, I have four screens. I don't know about y'all but I think that's the only way I can do it is four shots. So uh, here goes number one and I'll, I'll try to give you a count. So, okay, one, two, three. <laughs> okay, that's the first one. Isn't this fun? Y'all can chat amongst yourselves while we're doing this too. Or <laughs> Here comes the second one. All right. Oh, let's see. Well, all devs taking the photos or taking the opportunity to say thank you again to everybody that uh, spoke in this session, particularly Martin and Sharon and, uh, and Kate and Deb. Um, thank you again for the session organizers. Um, and for the conference organizers and thank you very much to all of you for spending your time here today it's been much appreciated and i hope you enjoy the rest of tadwick it's like a whole week's worth stretching out in front of you
good luck to the organizers for getting through to Friday. <laughs> yeah. That's an amazing amount of human effort and expertise going into this. I'm on three. I just did the third screen, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> We can ask Zoom to uh, add a new feature. There we go. That's it. I did it. We did it. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thanks. See you again. Well done. Bye. Stopping the recording. Yay. All right.